I have a confession to make, and that's that I am a car nerd. <laughs> I've been a car nerd all my life. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I read every car magazine uh, that I could find, and I memorized the zero to 60 times of every car in there, and the braking times, and the tire sizes, and I could recall them at will. Ask, ask me a question, I had the answer. And I did it for years after years after years, could tell you all the changes, I was fascinated. I also became fascinated in engines and combustion. And I had access to technical papers uh, before I went into high school. And I studied to where I could describe the difference between detonation and pre-ignition in the combustion process. Now, how many of y'all, think back to your high school years, how many had a conversation about the differences in detonation and pre-ignition in the combustion cycle? <laughs> okay, it's like I thought zero, me too. Uh, but I was prepared. And, and uh, the truth is that, that uh, I, I went on, I realized if I wanted any kind of social life, I would need to talk about more than cars and have a broader, a broader uh, repertoire. And the truth is, I, I, I really worked to do that. But in my heart, what I love and who I am and where my passion is, is around cars. So you'll understand why I think I have the absolute best job in the world. As the managing director of AAA's automotive engineering effort, I have a chance to drive one or two new cars a week equipped with all the latest bells and whistles, the coolest stuff you can get on a car. It's really awesome. I have a chance to take cars to a racetrack or a test facility and test one against another uh, or test multiple cars against each other. Just, and, and not just to rank one better than the other, but to begin to get an understanding of how they work, why they work, why they do what they do, and form opinions that I can share with motorists uh, so they, they have an unbiased point of view on what cars can do and they can get the most out of their car. In that role, I was recently driving a Volvo XC90. Now, I want to tell you a couple of things about this car. Uh, the first is it's one of, of the five or six best cars that have level two autonomous technology that you can buy today. And level two means that the driver needs to be fully engaged in the driving process. Have to keep your hands on your wheel, eyes on the road. Uh, it's not the, the George Jetson stuff of, 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 you know, you can read a book, watch a video, go to sleep while the car drives itself. That'll happen someday, not today. The Volvo does all the tricks great. It can, uh, with the driver engaged, it will accelerate and brake. It'll turn, keep you from hitting uh, uh, the, the lines in the road, uh, where it really shines is when things uh, surprise you. So maybe a car pulls out unexpectedly or a pedestrian steps out in front of the car. Uh, the, the, the Volvo is just tremendous at, at tightening up the seat belt and stopping very quickly, better than we can as humans. But the thing that stood out to me the most might be counterintuitive to you, and that's that, that the car really knew its limitations. There is a particular road that I try to drive cars on that have the ability to self-center in the lane uh, or, or, or help uh, avoid collisions. And if you can envision a road with a long sweeping left-hand turn, and right in the middle of that turn, it opens up to two turn lanes, a left and right turn lane. Now, cars that have this technology use cameras to look at the road to figure out where they are spatially in the road. So as long as you have lines, things are pretty good. Well, take those lines away and things start to be a challenge. And then add something like a car setting in one of those lanes, and the radar is shooting out saying the camera sees something, the radar says it's close, you're closing on it. Cars really are challenged in this circumstance. And to me, this is what I look for because cars with this technology do great 99% of the time. It's that just sliver of a time that they have some challenges, and that's what I seek to find. And in this car, what stood out to me is this that it knew its limitations, it saw the roadway, it let me know there was a problem quickly, it very seamlessly handed control back over to me and kept things safe. And that gave me comfort because if it knows its limitations, then it knows when, it can, when I should be doing the driving and it knows when it's capable of doing it. I felt really good about that. So as you might imagine, I'm really an advocate for this. I think there's tremendous potential uh, in, in level one and level two autonomy and moving long-term to level three and four. but but. The truth is, is that not all motorists are there. AAA conducted research and found that 90% of drivers are afraid to share the road with an autonomous car. And 80% of motorists are afraid to ride in a car that has autonomous technology. Wow. And there are actually people that have collision avoidance 
and lane centering, lane keeping ability, that are turning it off in their car. They have the technology and they're turning it off. That's a real problem. So, time for a little bit more insight. Some additional research turned up driver attitudes towards this stuff, and, and, and while the, the scope is pretty large, I'll, I'll categorize them as really three categories. There are drivers that, that just don't think about it. You know what, they, they probably peripherally know that there's autonomous cars out there and they've probably heard something, maybe good, maybe bad. In the grand scheme of things, it's not very important to them. There's another category of people that maybe they know a little bit about it, but in that moment of truth, when they're buying a car, See, when you check that box that says, yep, I want lane keeping assistance and I want collision avoidance and all those other things, there, there, there's actually a price tag associated with it. It might be $3,000 or $6,000. But at that moment of truth, they decide it's not worth it. And there's a third category of people. And those are people that say, you know what, cool stuff, just not for me, it's for the other drivers. Well. Let's take a look at that. I'd like to highlight some differences between human drivers and what cars are capable of if, if designed properly. Uh, the easiest way to do that is to look at reaction time. So when you think about something that surprises you in the roadway, by the time you see it, process what you need to do about it, uh, decide how you're going to respond, and then let's say move your foot from the gas pedal to the brake, um, in round numbers, uh, that's going to take a second and a half. So let me put some perspective on one and a half seconds. One and a half seconds at 65 miles an hour. Think of a tractor trailer. Now think of three tractor trailers end to end. That's how far you'll travel in a second and a half at 65 miles an hour. Now let's think about how the car responds to it. From the time the car senses a problem, processes that it needs to do something, and starts to apply the brakes is about eight hundredths of a second. In eight hundredths of a second at 65 miles an hour, you travel about eight or nine feet, so maybe just a little bit further than I am tall. In my mind, the potential of this technology is, is tremendous. But not everybody feels the same way. So we can think of, of, of what is an average driver. Let's think about that in a different sense. Um, there's a term called illusory superiority. And psychologists would say that we all think we're just a little bit better than average. So if you ask a group of people, are you a good driver, average driver, worse than average? Most everybody's a little bit better than average, maybe a lot better than average. Okay? And we know average means half or better and half or worse, right? But people overestimate their, their, their capabilities. Uh, I'd like to share with you uh, some of the folks that I work with, a, a team of dedicated individuals of scientists and engineers uh, that really do most of the work and make so much of what we do possible. Uh, these individuals, I think, would say that they're better than average drivers. Uh, but I might, there, there's a little bit more going on here. Uh, two of the individuals on the screen have NHRA, uh, which is the Hot Rod Association, drag racing licenses. One of them has Sports Car Club of America, a road racing license. So they're really pretty good drivers. To make my point, I'd like to share a video. And as this video plays, the one thing I'd like you to do, there's going to be a dragster in the car, in the, in the uh, video. I'd like you to look at the light right in front of the left front tire. When that light goes from yellow to green, that's when they have to accelerate. And really what determines a winning race besides a good car is a driver that can respond quickly. So let's take a quick look at this video. cool. Reaction time, three hundredths of a second. That's a whole lot better than average. Top speed about 272 miles an hour. Now the individual driving that uh, was the lady on the left hand side of the screen, Megan McKernan. That's her top alcohol dragster uh, and, and it is an impressive sight. I would tell you her reactions are faster than average. Uh, she's certainly a better driver than I am. So uh, we have a great staff, a great pool of people that we work with in multiple locations. And so we challenge them, kind of a fun challenge. Uh, there are cars out there that can park themselves. They can parallel park themselves. So wouldn't it be interesting to see if better than average drivers, whether they're proven better than average or whether they're self-proclaimed, uh, could beat a car at parking itself? 
So we picked five cars, five drivers. Each driver tried five times, each car tried five times, and we'll figure out what we come up with. The truth is, in the end of the test, the winner was able to park a car 10% faster, was able to park 37% closer to the curb, had 47% fewer moves and did it with 81% fewer curb strikes. They hit the curb a whole lot less. Yeah, it was the car. The car beat our better than average drivers. And I go through this story because it's important to note that the potential for a car to really do good is there. And it's critically important that we think about that because um, last year, there were 37,000 people that died on the roadway in motor accidents. That's four, up 14% from the year before. These numbers are increasing. And it's estimated that 94% of those accidents were due to human error. So if we could, if there was something in a car that could help us be more safe and keep the people we love and care about safe, who wouldn't want that? It'd be a great opportunity. Cars are increasingly complex in the cockpit. There's more to learn, they're distracting. More than ever, we need this type of assistance. So the question really comes up, so what do we do? Where do we go? I don't think anybody could disagree. Technology is there, the need is there. I think there are three actions we can take. The first is really simple, and that's help people understand what we're talking about. You know, today there's terms like uh, IntelliSafe, and EyeSight, and SuperCruise, which are really cool brand names, but they don't tell you a whole lot about what to expect from the car. What if we were just a little bit more clear about it and said, you know what, this car will help you help prevent an accident, and it'll do it in a certain way. What if it said we can help you avoid a collision with a pedestrian? Some can, some can't. But by managing those expectations, we set people up to enjoy the experience, to understand what their cars can do, what they need to do to make it happen, what's their role in all of this, uh, and, and they're not disappointed when their cars actually work. The second thing we need to do is create advocates. So we don't need everybody sitting around the Sunday dinner table talking about sensor fusion and light around a chip. What we need to do is get the innovators and the early adapters to engage with this, understand what's going on, and turn them into champions that communicate to the broader audience about the good things that this technology can do. And the third thing is we need to educate consumers and engage consumers in their cars. And we need to do this in a broad scope of things, whether it be stuff in the cockpit or self-driving features. Uh, autonomous features, but, but you know, you could say, well, it's in the owner's manual. Why not take a look? Owner's manuals today are this thick, and I can promise you, I read a lot of them because they're entertaining, right? But, but, <laughs> but it's hard to figure out what it is and what it's supposed to do. And it, it, now, oftentimes, it's not even in a book anymore. It's on a DVD, maybe on the Internet. There are actually cars today that use augmented reality to help the owner understand how to use the features of their car. This is complex stuff. So putting it in a book or putting it online, people aren't reading it. So let's take a new look. I, I recently bought a, a piece of technology, and when I bought it, they, uh, uh, they, they this isn't a big stretch on where I went, but they, they actually sat down and showed me how to use it. They updated all the material, they showed me how to use it, they asked me some questions about what I specifically did with it, and then gave me some tips on how to use it better. That was for a $1,000 piece of technology. Couldn't we do that with a car that costs thirty or fifty or $60,000? Maybe that's not the model. Maybe it's not set down. Maybe what we need to do is think of something like a geek squad where somebody would come to you and help you and your family understand how to get the most out of your car, how to use it, how to use it safely, uh, how to contrast that with other vehicles you have. Maybe that's the model. And there's a third model. Maybe, maybe that is uh, we don't need to do books at all. We need to move towards gamification. So make it interesting to read an owner's manual. I want to see that. <laughs> that is way cool. But, but the truth is, is that the way we're doing it now isn't working. So we need to do something better. So I'm going to take my hat off for just a second as a, as a, as a car nerd. Okay, and I'm going to talk to you uh, as a husband and a father and a friend and a neighbor, 
Uh, 37,000 deaths is unacceptable. We can do better than that. So if you agree with me, I've, I've given you three ideas that we can move forward on. If you agree, let's get going, let's do it. If you have better ideas, let's have a discussion, but let's not stay where we are. Because if we don't bring the driver along with technology and engage them in what's happening, they're not going to be with us. They're not going to help us implement the potential of this technology. There's ultimately no ride without the driver. Thank you so much.